Today, um, we are going to be looking into the very last chapter of uh, First Thessalonians. Okay, so the last chapter is chapter 5. And in order to better understand the last chapter, we need to begin by looking at the previous chapter, which is chapter 4. Okay, chapter 4 begins with verse 1. Finally, then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. Okay, Paul wants them to excel still more. Verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so Paul here is reminding the Thessalonians that previously they have been given instructions and commandments pertaining to Christian living. Well, he did affirm them saying that they do walk in accordance to the previously given instructions, but Paul wants them to excel in them. As far as these previously given instructions are concerned, Paul thinks that they can do better. Paul wanted them to excel more with regards to sexual purity, brotherly love, doctrine of resurrection of departed Christians, readiness for second coming, respecting church leadership, church discipline, ministry of helps, patience. Paul wants them to excel in Christian graces, to have a joyful spirit, to excel in prayer, excel in having a spirit of thanksgiving, and finally, to respect and to test prophecies. Now just by taking a glance at this and also at the Bible, you'll notice that the final instructions given to the Thessalonians from verse 12 onwards are very, very brief. For example, the final instructions that Paul wants them to excel in is not to despise prophecies but to test them. But yet, he did not elaborate on how, how exactly are we supposed to test prophecies. Now bear in mind that these are instructions that have been previously given by Paul already. So very likely, Paul didn't bother to elaborate on these final instructions, probably because the Thessalonians, they already know them. And they know them because they have been previously taught by Paul. So probably that's why Paul just ran through the list very quickly. Okay, so today, we want to just zoom in on a portion that Paul spent a little more time elaborating on, which is the portion about the end times. Now this portion on end times took up a whole 11 verses, 11 verses, which is a lot more than all the other instructions. But before we enter into this end time instructions, okay, these end time discussions, uh, I'm going to show you a picture. And this picture that I'm going to show you next is not for the faint hearted. Okay, it's going to be quite scary for some of the adults. But parents, you don't have to cover the eyes of your kids because it has no effect on kids at all. It's just scary for some adults only. Okay. Okay, for those who are not aware, this is how a Singapore parking attendant looks like. So today we are going to have a little discussion about three types of people who gonna parking tickets. Okay, let's go through them one by one, okay? Okay, the first type of people who gonna parking tickets are those who say, Oh, this is such a secluded place in Singapore. Surely the parking attendant will come all the way here and give someone's right. So, type one are those who believe that the parking attendant won't show up. That's why they turn around parking ticket. Okay, type two. Second type of people who turn parking tickets are those who say, no problem, I'll just park here for just a little while just to buy lunch, then I'll drive off. I'm sure the parking attendant won't come so soon. So type 2 are those who believe that the parking attendant won't come so soon. That's why they cannot parking ticket. Okay, now we come to type 3. Now the third type of people who cannot parking tickets are those who say, okay, the parking attendants down here, they always come during lunch time. So I'll park my car here for the whole day, but I'll tear the coupon only until lunch time. Good enough. But one day, when the parking attendant delay her coming and shows up after lunch, then these people are gonna. So type 3 are those who believe that the parking attendant won't come so late. So they think she'll come very soon. So they didn't prepare enough coupons to last the whole day. That's why they cannot parking ticket. So here we have the three types of lawbreakers. Three types of people who are not ready for the coming of the parking attendant. 
Type one, people who don't believe that the market attendant will actually show up. Type two, people who don't think that the coming of the market attendant uh, won't, uh, won't be so soon. People who think that the coming of the market attendant won't be so soon. Type three, people who think that the coming of the market attendant will be very soon. Okay, so bear in mind these three types of people who are not ready for the coming of the market attendant. Let's now take a look at the final chapter of First Thessalonians. Okay, so zooming in on the end times, let's begin with chapter 5, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now as to the times and the epochs, epochs means periods and seasons. Okay, so to the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Okay, Paul is saying this possibly because they are already very well taught about end time doctrines. That's why Paul can say confidently in verse 2, For you yourself know full well, you know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Verse 3, while they, okay, the day here refers to unbelievers, okay, the people of the world. While they are saying, peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. So as far as the second coming of Christ is concerned, the people of the world will be caught unaware as they don't believe in Jesus, much less his second coming. Now we move on to verse 4. Verse 4 says, But you, brethren, you are not in darkness, that the day will overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Paul here says that the second coming will not overtake us. Now what does that mean? Does it mean we will know the exact day of Jesus' second coming? No, definitely not. Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, But of the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but the Father alone. So if even Jesus, who is fully man and fully God, can say that he does not know which day he will be coming back, then how can any human being claim to know when the second coming will be? Okay, so let's be clear that no human being will know the day of the second coming. But will Christians know the rough timing or the rough season of Jesus coming? Well, that is debatable and it entails a long discussion, so we've got no time to deal with that today. But what I can say is, as far as 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 is concerned, when Paul says, the day will not overtake you, Paul is not referring to the Thessalonians knowing the timing or even the rough timing of the second coming. But what Paul is really saying when he says, the day will not overtake you, is that the Thessalonians will be able to recognize, will be able to recognize the second coming event when the event takes place because the immediate signs surrounding the second coming are very obvious signs. Very obvious signs. Okay, let's uh, take a look at the very obvious signs that our Lord Jesus spoke about that will lead to his second coming. Okay, for this, we shall look into the book of Matthew, and now would be a good time for you to refer to your servant handouts. Okay, we are going into Matthew chapter 24. Okay, the servant outline is there. Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to read from verse 25. It says here, Behold, now this is our Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples, giving them advance notice. So Jesus says to his disciples, Behold, I have told you in advance. Verse 26. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms. Who are very secretive in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So very obvious signs. Just as the lightning fills the whole sky and catches the attention of everybody, the second coming will be like that. It wouldn't be secretive like in the inner rooms, but it will be out in the open for all to see. You just need to look up, lift up your heads, and you see lightning. You don't have to hunt around for lightning, you just need to look up. Similarly, similarly, if you wish to look for a corpse, you want to look for a dead body. You don't have to hunt high and low in the wilderness or in the inner rooms. Just simply lift up your heads and look up. When you see vultures circling around, gathering around the sky, there you'll see the dead body, where the corpse is. So Jesus is saying that the second coming is going to be very loud and flashy. It's not like his first coming when he came in a very obscure inner room in Bethlehem, but 
but for his second coming, everybody can see. It's going to be big, flashy, loud, it's going to be very obvious. Okay, reading on verse 29. But immediately, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay, so these are very obvious cosmic signs. Verse 30, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Verse 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. Okay, or the Jews will understand this as the sound of a ram's horn. Okay, those who are in Timothy fellowship, you know how a ram's horn sounds like. Okay, so um, the Jewish understanding is that this great trumpet is the sound of a ram's horn. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds. Okay, this is probably the, the rapture when believers will be caught up with Jesus in them. From one end of the sky to the other. So these will be the signs that will precede the second coming. And notice that these signs can happen in a very short span of time. In fact, all these signs can happen within a day or within an hour. Okay, moving on, verse uh, 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, okay, all these things refer to the cosmic signs. Uh, we just read this Okay, so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father alone. Now why is it so important for Jesus to spell out the signs of his second coming so clearly? Now imagine if the church is kept in the dark as to how the second coming will take place, then we would be susceptible to deception from false Christ. Now imagine, if a cult leader appears from nowhere, claiming to be the Christ, how can we tell that he's bluffing? Well, that's the advantage of knowing the signs, because by knowing the signs, we can immediately say that he's a cult leader and he's bluffing since his appearance is not accompanied by obvious cosmic signs. So understand that these cosmic signs are, are for the purpose of recognizing the event and not for the purpose of forecasting when the event will take place. Now similarly, when Paul says that the event will not overtake us in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.4, it is not because we can forecast or even roughly forecast when the event will take place, but because we can recognize the event on the actual day, actual hour when it does take place. It is in this sense that Paul says the event shall not overtake us Christians. Okay, reading on verse 27, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the, uh, the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. So now Jesus begins to describe to us a certain type of people who will not be ready when a second coming takes place. Now just like during Noah's time, there will be people who don't believe that judgment day is coming. So they continue to eat, drink and make merry and they think that people like Noah, they think that Christians like us who live radical lives for Jesus, that we are crazy. So type 1 people are people who believe that the second coming won't happen. They are like people in the days of Noah. Now the next section forms an introduction. Okay, an intro to the next two types of people who are not ready for the second coming. Okay, let's read on verse 42. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Verse 45. 
Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at, their prop at the proper time? Verse 46. Blessed is the, that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Okay, so this forms the end of the intro for pack two and pack three people who are not ready for the second coming. Okay, reading on. Verse 48. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on the day when he does not expect him and at an hour which he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the second type of people that our Lord Jesus describes that are not ready for the second coming are people who believe that Jesus is coming back again but thinks that he won't come back so soon. So these are the, pe uh, the people that say, never mind lah, you know, probably Jesus won't come back within the next 10 years. So I'll just enjoy life first, just, I, just, I just live life the way I like it. Then maybe start thinking about Christianity, start thinking about Jesus, start thinking about living for Jesus in my retirement age, retirement years when I make enough money, when I have enough fun. So that would be the type two people. Okay, now we're reading on from where we left off, and it happens to be a new chapter, verse uh, uh, chapter 25. So Matthew chapter 25, verse 1, it says here. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten, ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lambs, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in flask along with their lambs. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. Okay, now this is the parable of the ten virgins or parable of the ten bridesmaids. And I used to think that this is a parable about five bridesmaids who fell asleep while the other five are very alert, they are all ready. Uh, but later on I realized actually all of them fell asleep. All of them, all ten of them, they got drowsy and fell asleep. Even the wise ones, they fell asleep. But the difference is that the wise ones, they took enough oil. In other words, they were prepared for a long wait. The five foolish ones were not prepared for a long wait because they didn't think that the bridegroom would come so late. So the third type of people who are not ready for the second coming are people who think that Jesus will come back very soon. So maybe after one or two years of waiting, they start to slack already. In other words, step three people are not ready for a long wait. So here we have the three types of people who are not ready for the second coming. So which type do you think you are in danger of? Now as Christians, I don't think any of us will be in danger of being type 1. Okay? The danger for us is possibly falling into type 2 or type 3. Now, I remember some 15 years back while I was studying in Australia, and uh, it was at night I was fast asleep, and suddenly I was awoken by a very loud sound. Very loud sound. Later on, I, I, I discovered from my roommate, once he went to the window and checked what's the loud sound about, then he told me that all oh, is because some car was falling downstairs, so it was that loud sound that woke me up. But from my perspective, it doesn't sound like a car falling, because I woke up in the middle of the sound. So, I didn't hear, what I heard was, because it was in the middle of the sound that I woke up, right? So from that perspective, it sounds like a ram's horn. And at the time, I know what a ram's horn sounds like. So, and then the, the sound was long and sustained. So I really thought it was a ram's horn. Yeah. So I the first thing on my mind is, okay, this is the second coming. <laughs> this is it. This is it, man. So that was all on my mind. Then when the sound stopped, the first thing on my mind is, why am I still here? Am I left behind? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Then later I heard some footsteps. Then I heard uh, my roommate talking to me. He said, oh, it's just some car downstairs. Okay, then I realized, okay. I'm not left behind. <laughs> and that was the year 1999. Okay, so um, in, the, in those years, 1999, year 2000, year 2001, uh, there was a lot of talk about the second coming, about the rapture. So those thoughts were forefront of my mind. 
And then comes 2002, 2003, 2004 and so on. And it just seems like Jesus is not coming back so soon anymore. So I do notice uh, myself being less fervent as a Christian compared to those in many years. So from personal experience, I do see that having an expectation of the second coming in the forefront of our minds does have an impact on our fervency as a Christian. So, that's why this is God's wisdom on this issue. God's wisdom on this issue is to keep on believing that it can happen anytime. Now, in the passage that we have just examined, the consistent instruction from the Lord is to be alert and be ready by believing that the second coming can occur anytime. And that is what God hopes to drill into our minds. Now, if you have this expectancy in your mind, what do you think you will do differently today? Think about that. Always be alert, always be ready. That is God's message to us. Now, if that is God's message to us, then the next question we want to ask ourselves is how? How to be alert? How to be ready? How to be prepared for the second coming? Now, after the parable of the ten virgins is the parable of the talents, which is another end time parable, but we have no time to look into that today, so we'll skip this parable of the talents and move on to the next section, which gives us a huge clue as to what Jesus meant when he says, be ready and be alert. Matthew 25, verse 31. He says here, But when the Son of Man, when he comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd shepherds the sheep from the goats. Reading on verse 33. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now let's find out the criteria that Jesus will be using to determine who will inherit the kingdom and who will be left out of the kingdom in his second coming. So Jesus continues saying, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you, you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, the righteous will answer Jesus, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did it unto me. So these are the people who will be rewarded with the kingdom. Okay, now we're going to find out who are those who will be left out of the kingdom. Verse 41. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and we did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, they will go to hell, but the righteous into eternal life. So those who will inherit the kingdom, and we see eternal life are righteous people who does acts of love. Serving the poor, serving the underprivileged, serving the foreigners. And those who are left out of the kingdom, those who will go away into eternal punishment are those who don't do acts of love. So it seems like doing acts of love is a heaven and a hell issue. Now, but of course, acts of love obviously cannot be seen as a standalone criteria for salvation or else salvation will be by works as opposed to by faith. So we need to take a step back and consider the whole counsel of God so that we can view the criteria of acts of love from the big picture perspective. And so let's do that by considering the parable of the sower. Now the parable of the sower is the mother of all parables. 
they one day are preach of the parable of the soul on one day. Okay, why do I say parable of the soul is the mother of all parables? Well, that's because Jesus himself, he asked his disciples, if you don't understand this parable, if you don't understand the parable, parable of the soul, uh, then how will you understand all the other parables? In other words, parable of the sower is the key that unlocks all the other parables. And why is that? Because the key trust of the passage, the key trust of the parable of the sower is about hearing. Okay, you get your hearing right, you get all the other parables right. Now in the parable of the sower, fruit bearing is talked about a lot. But the parable of the sower is not about fruit bearing. If you read the parable of the sower, then you end up telling yourself that you have to bear fruit, you have to bear fruit. Then you miss the key point because the main trust of the parable is about hearing, hearing. Whether you bear fruit or not is merely an indication of whether you are hearing rightly or not. So parable of the sower is a call to hear, hearing. Now this call to hear is repeated in all three synoptic gospels, okay, the Matthew, the Mark, the Luke. Parable of the sower is about hearing. That's why it is the mother of all parables because hearing is the mother of all activities. So, I need to comment all of you right here. I know a lot of you, you are very tired, you slept very late last night. <laughs> okay, but you are sacrificing your precious time here to hear the word of God, the mother of all activities. That's what you're doing right now. Now, when Moses gave the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, what was the very first command he gave? When he gave the Ten Commandments, what was the very first command that he gave in Deuteronomy 5? Now, when Moses gave the Ten Commandments, the very first command he gave is here. Because he says, Hear, O Israel, the mother of all activities. Now, in fact, our salvation begins with hearing. Because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. So the key trust of the parable of the sower is take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. That's the key trust. What you hear is the word of Christ. Because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Now we don't have time to uh, dig deeper into the parable of the sower, but I can tell you that the parable of the sower is also about the condition of the heart. How we should hear God's word with a humble heart. We hear with a humble heart, hearing with a humble heart. So with that in mind, let's go back to our Thessalonians passage. Okay, back to Thessalonians chapter 5. Okay, reading from verse 5, it says here, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, Drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So here we get a little clue of what Paul's understanding of being sober means. For Paul, being sober, being watchful, being alert, being vigilant, being ready for the second coming has got to do with the elements faith, love, and hope. Faith, love, and hope. Now notice that faith and love is not assigned to different armors, but both are assigned to the same armor, which is the breastplate. And that's because in Paul's theology, faith and love goes together. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. It says here, It was for freedom that Christ has set us free, no longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. That's from uh, the song, Jesus We Celebrate Your Victory. For those who are not aware, that's the first verse. Then verse 2 says, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Verse 4, reading on. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Fall from grace. Verse 5. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. So what's our value? The only thing that's our value, the only thing that counts is faith. But how does faith express itself? Faith expressing itself through love. So here the Apostle Paul shows us that we don't fall from grace because we tell lies, because we cheat on our parking coupons. On the contrary, we fall from grace when we keep the commandments, thinking that by keeping the commandments, we have right standing with God. So when you endeavor to live a righteous life, thinking that that will earn you justification points, God says to you, you have fallen from grace. So as far as right standing with God is concerned, your law keeping counts for nothing. But when it comes to right standing, when it comes to justification, what truly counts is faith. Faith that expresses itself through love. Now, the book of James says that faith without works is dead. True saving faith always expresses itself in acts of love. True saving faith is always accompanied by good works of love. Now, the, the love here, right, in this context, is not talking about those spiritual love, you love God. No, this love here is a very practical love because Paul is going to go on to talk about loving thy neighbor. Okay, so this love here is practical love your neighbor kind of love. So when we consider the whole counsel of God, this here is the linkage in which we understand what it means to be ready for the second coming of Christ. So when Jesus comes back again, he will divide people into two groups like dividing sheep and goats. The criteria used will be acts of love or the lack of it. But the foundation for the acts of love must be faith. And true saving faith expresses itself through love. So if you find that you're not faring well in your acts of love, then you might want to check on your faith. And if you wish to work on your faith, then you need to work on your hearing. Since faith comes by hearing, the mother of all activities. Now finally, we're going to talk about hope. Okay, reading on verse 8, it says here, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope of salvation. Verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Hope of salvation. Obtaining salvation. Now understand that the salvation is used here not in the sense of forgiveness of sins or removal of guilt because that is already done. Okay, Paul is speaking to Christians. But the term salvation is used here in the sense of finally being able to live together with God. That is what we are created for in the first place. Living together with God. He's talking about our glorification. Okay, coming together to live with God. That is our long scope. Genesis 3 8 describes what happened after Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. Verse 8 says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, this is the scenario that the writer of Genesis painted for us. Now, we can imagine that before Adam fell, he would have walked with God in the cool of the day. That is what we were created for, and that is our destiny. All Christians are appointed. Not to rev, but appointed to walk with God in a setting of perfect ecology, in the cool of the day. Now I'm going to close with this. This here is an article from a leadership journal some time back. I think some of you, um, the older ones, you must have remembered this movie, which was a huge box of this success. And this is an article about the movie Avatar. Okay, the title of this article, it reads, Avatar Serves Longing for Another World. Okay, let me read to you a snippets of this article. Okay, it says here, James Cameron's box office hit Avatar takes place on the planet Pandora, a lush wilderness inhabited by a race of 10 foot tall blue natives known as the Navi. Cameron's fictional world impacted many viewers in surprising ways. Within a week of its debut, websites dedicated to the 3D movie were filled with comments lamenting the fact that Avatar's people in places could not be reached. And here's a quote. When I woke up this morning after watching Avatar for the first time yesterday, 
the world seemed gray, no one fan. It was like my whole life, everything I've done and worked for lost its meaning. In other words, <laughs> the day after I saw Avatar, I was completely depressed. Seeing it again and again makes me feel good. I legitimately love all of Pandora, and waking up afterwards is extremely hard to do. Thousands of additional comments express longing to visit Pandora, and most express a sense of depression because of the impossibility. For others, the movie intensified a deep dissatisfaction in their everyday lives and a desire for a fresh start someplace new. So deep down inside every human being is an innate longing for a whole new world, a whole new world of perfect ecology, perfect paradise. But when the people of the world, when they realize that this world, this new world that they are longing for is a mere impossibility, when they realize they have no hope for such a longing, they get depressed. But we, we are not like the people of the world. What is hopeless for them is reality for us. Walking with God in perfect ecology, walking with God in the cool of the day is our very real hope, is our very real destiny. And that is what Jesus died to give us, walking with God in the cool of the day. Come, let's close the prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. His death and resurrection is what gives us hope for the future. We ask that you will help us to be ready at all times for the second coming of our Lord Jesus. We ask that you clothe us, O Lord, with faith, love, and hope as we await for his second coming. Pray us all this in the name of Jesus Christ.